Kim Day has supported independent tech news directly for about five years. Be like Kim. Become a DTNS member right now at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 10th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And sweltering in L.A. County, I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We have got some E3 stuff to talk about this week. We're going to talk about the Microsoft announcements today. Uh, tomorrow, Patrick Beja will be back to kind of give us an overview of what's been important. Uh, and Scott Johnson's going to follow up uh, with some of his favorite things on the show on Wednesday. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Salesforce announced it will acquire data analytics and visualization company Tableau for $15.7 billion, all in stock. Tableau will continue to operate independently after the acquisition. Both company boards have approved the deal. The acquisition is part of Salesforce's plan to expand beyond its CRM business and bring advanced analytics to the data already stored on its platform. That's where the money is made in the analytics these days. Uh, Google Assistant support in Waze began rolling out to U.S. Android users. The feature will let drivers report incidents, switch routes, and adjust navigation preferences by voice rather than touching the screen. The feature is limited to English for the moment. It has been 45 days since Samsung paused sales of the Samsung Galaxy Fold. In an email, Samsung told CNET's Jessica Dolcourt, we will announce timing in the coming weeks. So if you're curious and or keeping score, the status of the Galaxy Fold remains unchanged. We will continue to keep you up to date as this story unfolds. Get it? Yep. All right. Let's talk a little more about Google Stadia. What do they got? Let's do it. Google's upcoming Stadia game streaming service will let publishers offer their own game subscriptions through the streaming service. Stadia exec Phil Harrison says that he expects publishers to start thinking about their own subscriptions in relatively short order and that Google will support that on its platform and we'll see some announcements in due course around that. However, Harrison didn't name Electronic Arts specifically, although EA already offers EA Access, which is a subscription service that lets users download a selection of its games on Xbox One and soon the PS4 for a single monthly fee. EA has also confirmed it will offer games through Stadia, though hasn't announced any titles just yet. Yeah, so this is interesting. Uh, and, and there's so many questions around this. First of all, a lot of people think Stadia's setup is a little too complicated as it is. I think it'll get simpler once the foundation Founders Edition stuff is gone, and it's just you can play it for free, or if you want better resolution, ten dollars a month, and then you have to buy the games. Uh, it's just a service that's giving you the the bits, right? You may not like that, but it feels easy enough to explain. But now, if you bring in this, like, or you could not buy the games, you could also get a subscription. But it's not a subscription to all the games; it's a subscription to games from particular publishers. Not all the publishers are available. It starts to get real complex again. Uh, it does seem like Google's trying to cash in on the fact that EA and Blizzard and, and many others want to have subscription services tied to their publishing platform. Uh, so Google's like, well, let's let's expose you to even more people so you can have control, but then we get a cut of that money too. Yeah, I would think that if you were EA, this all has to be rolled out somewhat delicately, right? Because you don't want to take people away from your own subscription service. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's one of those situations like you have where, um, say, Stars sells a Stars subscription where you download the Stars app, you subscribe to it, and then you get the Stars content. Or mm -hmm. on the Apple TV, you can download the Stars app, subscribe through the Apple TV, and then Apple gets a cut. But it helps Stars get more subscribers. Right, or right. Stars on Prime Video, where it shows up in your Prime Video from Amazon. But Amazon has so many customers, it helps Stars. So it would be appealing to publishers who are like, yeah, we have our own service, but we'll, we'd will we have even more customers if we exposed it to Stadia. Of course, that's a big question because nobody really knows how many people are going to subscribe to Stadia in the first place. It's interesting because, and you know, I'm I'm the most non-gamer of the group, uh, but I've been sort of pulling folks that that are more in the space than me, especially because a lot of people are in town for E3. And you know, like, what do you guys think about Stadia? And and is there a lot of buzz around it? And everyone's sort of like, yeah, I don't know, it might be fine. Um, but uh, there there is less of an outrage of the idea of buying games in addition to the monthly fee than I thought that there would be. And I think a lot of that has to do with people being like, you know, you don't need like 300 games. 
you're only really going to play a few games at a time over and over again. And then, you know, you'd move on to something else. So, and that doesn't certainly apply to everybody, but I think that there's, there's enough of that trend going on that the, the revenue model isn't really, isn't putting people off, even though we're still in the early days. I mean, I, I would add like, you know, an Xbox one EA, um, EA access is, is something you can get no matter what you subscribe to, but you can only do the multiplayer aspect of those games unless you, uh, you can't do it unless you have Xbox gold. So there is, I mean, at least on the Xbox uh, live platform, there is some complication that can kind of make people maybe take, you know, if they're, if they're not super hardcore gamers, they don't need to play the latest battlefront, uh, or, or whatever. Um, it might put them at a pause. Like, well, I don't want to jump through two hoops to get some entertainment. If I have to jump through one, that's fine. But two, and now you're asking a lot. Yeah, Penny Arcade had a, uh, a comic on Stadia this morning that was pretty skewering. Uh, it has a, a kind of a generic person instead of one of their normal characters saying, I love playing hardcore high fidelity games, or at least I assume I would, but I don't own a console or a PC. That's why I think Google Stadia is for me. Uh, and I think that gets to the heart of the matter is, it's not that you know, I think that's overstating it for comic effect, which is what you do in a comic, right? But, but I think it does say like, you're going to have to convince people that instead of buying a PC, upgrading a PC or getting the next console, that Stadia is a better way to go because then they don't have to spend that money on hardware. And then the rest of this makes sense. If, if you've convinced me that like, you know what, I'd rather spend $120 a year on a service than pay for a piece of hardware, then buying the, the games, having subscriptions available through for games like I would on my desktop PC, that all starts to make sense. It's just getting people over that initial hump that they're going to have to do. And for, I think we're in that kind of uh, uh, crossover period where we have a lot of technologies that are overlapping on the audience. And, you know, people, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's in a flux, but it, it, there's definitely a, a, a shift and people will at some point decide whether or not they want to go with the old way and just continually upgrade, upgrade, or is Stadia just a very simple solution uh, to, you know, knock out a couple hours in the evening? Well, yeah. And the other part uh, that we haven't been paying attention to is eventually there will be the 720p service for free. And we don't know if the subscriptions that Google's talking about making available through Stadia would be available to the free users. Because if they are, then those subscriptions make even more sense of like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm a free player and I'll play what's available for free, but I could also pay for a subscription. I would assume Google would wanna make those subscriptions available to the free players as well. XDA developers noticed that Google Maps has a new off route alert in India that sends you an alert every time you go off course by at least 500 meters. Now, this would be helpful if you're driving and, and you got lost and say, hey, you're, you're way off course. Although if you're paying attention to the nav, you might notice that yourself, but it also works as a safety measure. So if you're in the car with someone else driving, you know, particularly like a taxi driver, uh, it would alert you if that taxi driver is taking a circuitous route, maybe trying to drive up your fare or taking it to the wrong place. Uh, last week, Google also started tracking delays in public transport and offered auto rickshaw fares for Google Maps users in India. I've actually noticed that public transport delay uh, stuff. It's, it's quite useful, especially for the buses here in L.A. Absolutely. And I haven't been to India in a while, but I have definitely been in the backseat of a taxi where I thought that our route was didn't seem quite right. And you know, at the time, this is not that recently, so I didn't have the smartphone capabilities that I have now and certainly not what Google Maps has just rolled out. But there have been incidents where I'm like, I don't know. This doesn't seem quite right. So having something that could send you an alert, send you a notification, like, hey, you're really off course here. Whether you're driving or someone else is driving, even if you don't feel that you're in danger, being in danger, of course, is that that would be a, a, a huge concern. But even if you felt like I uh, just we're wasting time or you know we're confused here, is is th these sorts of things do come up. Yeah. And I, I think about this. Uh, there've been a couple of times I am paranoid enough when I'm in a new city that I'm unfamiliar with, I will glue my eyes to Google maps during the taxi ride, uh, just to make sure like, okay, are they heading what seems to be the right direction? But I never know if this is the right route or not. Right. Uh, and then there are situations, at least here in Los Angeles, where to get to the same place, you could go eight or nine miles out of your way uh, because the traffic is less in that other way and end up being faster. Uh, 
Yeah. So this might alert me if I'm unfamiliar, like, hey, where are you going? This that, this doesn't seem right when it is, in fact, the right situation. So how do you navigate that when the guy says, oh, yeah, no, it's it's not the normal way. But believe me, this is much faster. I mean, that's that's what taxi drivers say, right? Yeah, but Google Maps has also gotten pretty good at being like, this looks bad on a map view, right. this but is this is actually the, the way that we want to yeah, go yeah. right now because it's 5 p.m. Yeah, for sure. Mozilla CEO Chris Beard told Germany's at three, uh, T3N that the company plans to launch a paid subscription version of Firefox by October, which would include features like a VPN and secure cloud storage. Current Firefox features would remain free, but subscriptions would offer premium features. For instance, the company is thinking of offering a free amount of VPN bandwidth with more as part of a premium subscription. He also mentioned secure storage. Mozilla hasn't decided how many services it will offer and whether or not there'll be multiple subscriptions or just one that includes everything. Yeah, the, this this interview is is really odd uh, because it, at least on the T3N site, it says that the, the press person then stepped in quickly and shut down that, that line of conversation, even though Chris Beard's the CEO, right? And, and was saying what he thought. There are a lot of details, it sounds like, that Mozilla probably ev hasn't even decided on, which is, is this just going to be the normal Firefox with some subscriptions offered for VPN and storage? Is it going to be a different version of Firefox with these features added? It sounds how much will like, it cost? Well, it sounds to me like it'll probably just be your normal Firefox, but they'll have some subscription features. Sure. And Mozilla's trying to decide should they all be one Mozilla subscription or should they be a la carte? I is this something we would pay for? This I I, 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 I don't feel think like I would yeah. pay for a browser, right? But that doesn't seem to be what he's describing in this interview. Yeah, would it goes I, above, and be, above and beyond the, the the browsing. If if I'm someone who doesn't want to spend a lot of time vetting VPNs and I trust Mozilla and they've got a long history of, of, of earning that trust, uh, I might say, okay, yeah, I'll go with the VPN. And, and, it, and I generally tell people do not use free VPN. But if there was a free VPN from Mozilla, like there was from Opera, Okay, may, that might be better uh, to use, uh, especially if it's backed by a paid upgrade version rather than by ads or selling your data, which you absolutely don't want out of a v VPN provider. Uh, secure storage is something they're already doing with file sharing. So if it just offered, you know, more features for that uh, and higher higher allowances for the storage. You know, I could see them building off that. I do like the idea of seeing Mozilla come up with alternatives to fund the development of the browser. Well, and I think you you really hit on something earlier when you said trust. Uh, Mozilla is a company that a lot of people trust. Whether or not you want to trust Mozilla with VPN, up to you. But that I, that definitely gives the company a big edge when, because like you said, you don't want to just like, Google VPN for free and go with the first result that comes up. You don't want right. to do that. There are lots of problems with that sort of thing. So yeah, can Mozilla say, can, can they bank on the fact that this is a company that has uh, good products, uh, the company that people believe in, trustworthy, and, 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 and can offer services on top of a free service that people will pay for? Yeah, has a lot to do with who they partner with, and they've partnered with, with reputable people in the past. So hopefully they continue to do that. Bloomberg Business Week's Jeff Wise has a feature on underwater drones. We, all, we always hear about drones in the air. How about those drones underwater? Uh, back in November, Ocean Infinity used a team of eight drones to discover the remains of the Argentine Navy sub San Juan. And in February, it found a Korean bulk ore carrier, the Stellar Daisy. Both vessels had been missing for more than a year. Uh, he also mentions in this article a project called Seabed 2030, which is a joint nonprofit venture to use drones to map the entire ocean floor in the next 11 years. So by 2030, have an entire map of the ocean floor, which you may not realize we have an entire map of Mars. We do not have an entire map of the Earth's own ocean floor. It's using the same Hugen drones as Ocean Infinity, which are made by Norway's Kongsberg Maritime. Hugens can dive up to 20,000 feet for 72 hours at a time uh, using a bunch of sensors, including sonar. It can also send and process a lot of uh, large amounts of data, which even five years ago you couldn't do. Among the benefits of increased mapping data are current Di uh, current direction, so you know where the currents are going. Uh, you can map that uh, better, and uh, f a lot of things that are fundamental to understanding the climate. 
We're going to find so many undersea worlds with these underwater drones. Uh, so you're thinking Aquaman is what that's what you <laughs> one can hope. Yeah, it's funny. You you do think of drones. As, oh, yeah, they're going to fly overhead. They're going to deliver packages and burritos and all sorts of stuff <laughs> for us and provide <laughs> us with Wi-Fi to. internet, right? But uh, but the but the underwater drones um, and the fact that there have been some really cool excavation missions that have already taken place uh, is it's fascinating. And especially because you're right, there's a lot about the underwater sea world that we still don't know, whether it's wreckage or creatures or, or yes, patterns of, 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 of sea life. And I don't know, the list goes on. Yeah, uh, there, there's all kinds of scientific data uh, that we we could make much better use of. Uh, think of the the recent airline crashes, like MH370 from Malaysian Airlines, where they they just couldn't find wreckage. Eventually, they found some washed up on a shore, but it's just incredibly difficult. I don't think any of us have a real conception of how vast the ocean is. Yeah. Uh, if you had these drones back then, you might have had a better chance. Now, years later, uh, yeah, maybe they'll they'll find more evidence of that, but it's likely that it has been dispersed uh, widely and degraded enough that it, it gets harder and harder all the time. But now we have these. So in future, looking uh, for evidence like that is important. Finding scientific data is important. Uh, and you, you, we, we explore Mars with, with essentially drones, right? With remote control robots. Uh, right. It's really costly to get them there. These aren't cheap, you know, these are tens of millions of dollars to create, but the ocean's right there, right? It's a lot cheaper to get to the ocean than it is to get to Mars. I love it. I do. Yeah, <laughs> submarines, not really enough. We need these drones. Uh, let's uh, let's explore our own ocean, shall we? Also, while we do it, we should be alert. Tom and Roger, I've got good news. Razor is entering the performance enhancing drinks market. Oh, dear. With, with something called Respawn. Oh, okay. Crap. Yeah, respawn, all caps. A drink containing 95 uh, milligrams, which is kind of the low end of a cup of coffee, but it's it's you know it's it, it's a jolt of caffeine per serving, produced in flavor powder packets that you mix in with water. Cost is twenty four dollars and ninety nine cents for a box of twenty. You also could get a branded mixer bottle for another thirty bucks if you wanted that. Sure. The Verge notes that while the company claims its packets add to increased alertness and focus and enhanced concentration. The marketing team didn't actually spell concentration correctly. Aww. Oh, yeah. Respawn comes in tropical pineapple, blue raspberry, pomegranate, watermelon, blah, and green apple. Wait, tropical pineapple. Is there another kind of pineapple? Is there none? City pineapple. Ur <laughs> yeah, city urban pineapple. pineapple. Yeah. Also, yeah. blue raspberry feels like an unnecessary distinction, except that they colored it blue. Because raspberry flavoring is probably just raspberry flavoring. Yeah, you know, I've always wondered that about blue raspberry. Why is it got to be blue? But uh yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, pleasant. it's it's listen, energy drinks. Some people are huge fans of energy drinks. Uh, I probably am not going to put razor respawn powder in my water, but uh, in a pinch, I don't know. Maybe you need a little pick me up or maybe some <sighs> coffee. Hand. Yeah, on the one hand, it's it's incredibly smart of Razor, the gaming brand, uh, mm -hmm. has a lot of cachet to to come up with another way to sell some stuff to gamers that they they probably have a decent margin on. Uh, and yet it's E3 and I think people expect <laughs> to see products from Razer at E3, um, not drink. What about powder. the branded mixer bottle, Tom? True. It is a, a bargain at $30, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It mixes uh, your water and your powder for you. Well, folks, uh, I know you have lots to say about this particular story. If any of you get the drink and want to send us a, uh, a taste test review, please do feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes at dailytechheadlines.com. Let's talk about Microsoft. Uh, they had their big announcement. In fact, kind of the only big announcement to be at E3 this year will be Microsoft. Sony's not presenting at E3. Nintendo never does. They do Nintendo Direct and they, they stream it to their booth at E3, but uh, they don't actually do it from on stage. E3 this year was almost entirely about titles. Um, and th there's nothing wrong with that. We're going to talk about some of the best titles later in the week. 
But Microsoft did spend some time talking about hardware and services in its announcement on Sunday. Uh, so hardware-wise, the successor to the Xbox One, Project Scarlet, did not get another name. It's still known as Project Scarlet. Remember, the Xbox One was Project Scorpio. This is Project Scarlet. It'll probably get its new name next E3 because they did say it will go on sale for the holiday 2020 season. So again, not a release date, but we know, okay, 2020, end of 2020, before December, sometime it'll go on sale. Uh, some some details, uh, GDDR6 RAM, uh, a new generation of solid state drive that they'll use as virtual RAM uh, to give you even more memory, promised 40 times performance increase in data bus bandwidth, custom AMD processor with Zen 2 and Radeon RDNA architecture, which is promised to be four times as powerful as the Xbox One X, uh, supporting 8K, 124 frames, or I'm sorry, 120 frames per second, uh, variable refresh rate, and real-time hardware accelerated ray tracing. So uh, that will make the NVIDIA bet on ray tracing a little bit of a better bet if, if suddenly ray tracing is being on your console as well. Uh, they say your games, your achievements, your progression, your accessories, and your console experience with Xbox all comes forward with Scarlet. So they're trying to make it sound like backwards compatibility won't be an issue. I'm sure it'll be an issue in some situations, but they're going to try to make it as little of an issue as possible. All right, before we get to Project X Cloud and the Xbox Game Pass announcements, Roger, what do you think of Project Scarlet with what little we know so far? Um, from what little we know, it, in many respects, it's very similar to what uh, Sony was offering for their next generation PlayStation. Now, what's interesting is they're talking about a new uh, SSD technology that can act as virtual RAM. A lot of be people have been pointing out something similar to Intel's Optane NVM, NVMe uh, st solid state uh, technology to basically uh, give the bandwidth that you need. The rest of it is very interesting. 8K comma 120 uh, frames per second variable fresh rate which probably means they're probably aiming for 120 uh, 20 frames per second on 4k with 8k yeah, maybe somewhere around there like a halo go but probably not going to be achievable um you know it's still too early to tell but it looks like they they wanted to release this announcement to at least match what sony uh, announced about their uh forthcoming uh playstation uh PlayStation console, although yeah, and both of them are being pretty cagey about it, right? Yeah. So it's not hard to do this. And uh, it's also very interesting to note that AMD is helping both again this time yeah. around. Uh, Halo Infinite was also announced as a launch title uh, for Project Scarlet whenever it launches. Let's get into the services. Xbox Game Pass Ultimate launched out of beta to everyone. So the plans that you can get from Xbox for your PC or your Xbox are as follows. For $10 a month, more than 100 PC games for your PC. That's Xbox Game Pass PC. If you want a console, $10 a month, more than 100 Xbox games for the Xbox Game Pass console games. Now, separately, if you want to play Xbox Online multiplayer games, you need Xbox Live Gold. That's $10 a month. However, there is a combination of Xbox Live Gold with Xbox Game Pass console games and Xbox Game Pass PC called Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. That's $15 a month, which you pay close to $30 a month if you've got each of them separately. So they're giving you about half off. Uh, the conversion ratio will apply. If you're already a subscriber, let's say to Xbox Game Pass and Xbox Live Gold, you can convert to Xbox Game Pass Ultimate and they'll take what months you have left on your existing subscriptions and convert them into credit for Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. So if you have any uh, codes or, or, or credits that you need to apply, you wanna do that before you switch to subscribing to Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. And they made a tiny announcement about Project X Cloud, which is a separate thing. That's, that's Xbox's streaming game platform. The Xbox Game Pass is about downloading a game and having it on either your console or your PC. X Cloud goes into preview this October. In the preview, it will give you the ability to stream games from your Xbox to your PC, your mobile devices, et cetera. It won't be demonstrating the cloud service yet. That's yet to come. Although Project X Cloud will eventually stream from Microsoft data centers to PCs, console, and mobile devices. So, but to start in October, it will just take games that you have on your Xbox and give you the ability to stream them to whatever you want, mobile device, PC, et cetera. 
I'm going to say I was really more excited about this uh, Ultimate Game Pass uh, offer that they that they did, just because um, if you are if I, I have an Xbox uh, and PC and PC gamer, um, you do save a bundle on it, and especially since gold, you know, with gold li- uh, um, Xbox uh, Live Gold uh, being with sixty bucks a year. I mean, if you can kind of consolidate that stuff, and I think this is what they were doing, which is trying to push people to this Ultimate Pass anyway. Um, it's a pretty good deal. I mean, I probably won't be able to take advantage of it until my kids quit harassing me when I have downtime. Uh, but at, when they're older and I can sit down for an hour or so, this this looks like a very compelling option. Uh, it still remains to be seen what the 100 PC games are. Uh, if there are a bunch of crap, ti- crap titles, probably not as interesting. Uh, but I doubt that's what they'll do. Um, and the xCloud, it'll, you know, I'll, I'll give it a whirl just to see how well it works on my spotty network at home. <laughs> uh yeah i mean and and if people are some people in the chat room are, are still kind of confused right now it's it's pretty to me it seems pretty simple you've got xbox live to play online and xbox game pass to download uh and play games and if you want to combine them it's 15 dollars a month yeah it, a part of it is they it's kind of like uh apple and itunes they put the they put the the xbox and everything and it's kind of it does kind yeah, of yeah exactly. Uh, if you don't have an Xbox, you just get uh, you can still get Xbox Game Pass Ultimate. That'll give you the online play with the PC games, or you just get Xbox Game Pass PC <laughs> and just just play the the PC versions of the games. But uh, but yeah, uh, I you know honestly, I was not that blown away by this. The Xbox Game Pass uh, changes seem like great changes. It make it makes the Ultimate Pass uh, almost impossible to turn down if you're a gamer. All the rest of the details, I'm like, okay, that's part of your details but where we will decide whether it's a good new xbox where we will decide if project x cloud is a really good streaming service is yet to be announced we we didn't get any of the determining factors yet and i and i think a a lot of this has to to do with you know they're still working on it but also trying to see what everyone else has up their sleeve right you don't want to give away uh too much or reveal uh things that might change down the road when you see what someone else has announced it's like oh maybe we can redo that and we'll still have time uh to change uh, some of the marketing yeah thanks everybody who participates in our subreddit gaming news there as well as lots of other news stories you can submit stories of your own and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com if you hang out on facebook join our group if you haven't already facebook.com slash groups slash daily tech news show all right let's check in with chris christensen the amateur traveler who has a tip for powering your technology on your next travel This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. A new device has made it into my travel bag, and I just used it on the trip that I did to Africa, and that is a travel power strip surge protector. So this is a small power strip, small enough to still fit in your backpack. I'm using a device by Upway that has four USB outlets as well as two regular outlets. You're still going to need a plug to plug it in no matter where you go in the world, but the advantage of this one is that it does voltage all the way from 100 volts up to 240 volts. What you don't want to do is take a U.S. surge protector to most of the rest of the world that uses a higher voltage because that will fry it. This device Mm -hmm. won't convert voltage, so if you're bringing your hair straightener, your hair dryer, you still are probably going to need a voltage converter. A travel power strip can help you in the hotel when they hide the plugs or also in the airports when there are just too few places to plug in. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Thank you, Chris. Always, always a pain trying to figure out voltage conversion. Like, talk about make it a standard, worldwide standard. I know it would be almost impossible to get countries because no country is going to want to change their standard, right? Right. Uh, but man, that would that would be nice if someday we could all just travel wherever we want and just plug stuff in. Mm-hmm. USB kind of, except for the voltage problem, right? U- USB could be that standard that everybody switched to, but you still have the different voltage delivery going on yeah thank you chris uh let's check out the mailbag let's do it so in a dtns special uh tom talked with yael eisenstadt a policy advisor at the center for humane technology 
and and got a lot of good feedback. Um, we the you the two of you were talking about social disruptions and who's to blame, who needs to fix what is broken. And one of the responses we got, uh, we'll we'll go ahead and 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 not leave their name because they say first a disclaimer: I work at Google. I don't speak for them, but works at Google. So I have a definite bias on the question of who is responsible for the alleged harms of technology. Ms. Eisenstadt made the claim that smart people should be able to solve these problems, but I argue. You can't even define the problems. I know it when I see it doesn't work in software. You need to be able to quantify exactly what harms you're trying to avoid and what the mechanism of those harms is. Saying the tech companies have smart people, they should fix it, is exactly as effective as saying God should make our world better. If you don't know exactly what it is or how it could be made better, don't ask engineers to try and solve it for you because we can't do it. Ask the scientists to understand it first, then we might be able to come up with a solution. The tech companies are engineering organizations. It's like asking food producers to make food safer without understanding germ theory. They can spend lots of money and effort on it, and believe me, they are, but nothing good will happen except by luck until the problems are understood. Yeah, this is a great point. Uh, and I, I know uh, Yael got uh, a little excited about like, hey, listen, I'm not the person who knows how to fix it, but I think the companies have a responsibility to help fix it at the end. And I'm sure that's what set off someone who works at Google, understandably. Uh, but it's still a really good point of we do need to define what the harms are and measure the effect of the harms. And that is one thing that I wish I had asked her anyway, except when in my pre-interview, uh, she said, yeah, I, I don't have much to tell you about the measurement side of things. So we, really what that interview was about was sort of saying, how do we determine, how do we get to the point that our, our Google employee here is saying, uh, we need to then have the conversation about how do we define the harms and how do we measure whether they are harms and if so, how harmful they are. So it's a, a great second, uh, a great number of questions that I think you should have at the end of that interview for sure. Thanks for writing in. Yeah, we got we got a lot of feedback about this particular interview. So, uh, you know, we'll keep them coming. And, and thanks to everybody for caring and and providing your 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 thoughts on the matter. Well, folks, uh, we thank you for supporting us. In fact, you got that Yael Eisenstadt interview a little earlier if you were a patron, uh, which is one of the things we do. I also had an editor's desk this week where I talked a lot about uh, the controversy with YouTube uh, and the demonetization or not uh, banning of certain channels. Uh, if you want to get that kind of content and, and just be part of the team, if you want to be one of the heroes that keeps DTNS live, loud, and independent, uh, join us right now. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. If you're in the L.A. area, don't miss the meetup at the Farmer's Market by the Grove, Wednesday, June 12th, 4 to 6 p.m. We'll be back with Patrick Beja tomorrow. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>